This show is bringing back to life the philosophy chamber. Between 1766 and 1820, Harvard uh, assembled this wide-ranging collection, a kind of cross-section of 18th century art and material culture. And this material, which was largely donated by alumni and supporters around the world, was brought together in one room that was called the Philosophy Chamber. The room is named for natural philosophy, which brought together all the sciences that we think about separately today. Chemistry, physics, astronomy, the first works to enter the collection are these teaching tools, big machines to create electricity, models to show how the planets move, specimens to learn what minerals are. They make a decision to start adding more and more art to that collection, which becomes the kind of backdrop against which uh, generations of students learn science with these New England merchants hovering over you. Later, there's also uh, Native American objects being collected. They don't play much of a role in teaching. Rather, they seem to make those cultures seem vanquished. They don't treat them on the same footing. They're not uh, particularly studied. They don't even seem, in many cases, to quite know what they are. It points to sort of the most challenging parts of Harvard's past and of 18th century knowledge. I hope the show will uh, provoke people to think about how we face, how we grapple with the more difficult parts of our history, even as they may have had good outcomes, such as building knowledge around science. This room wasn't just a picture gallery or a treasury house of static objects. It was a very live, um, almost laboratory or workshop-like space where people were convening around objects. It was an assembly point for artists and scientists and scholars and uh, advocates of revolution. The who's who of early American art and history. John Singleton Copley, Harvard's one of his biggest patrons. John Trumbull, Gilbert Stuart hang out in this space. A lot of presidents come through George Washington. John Adams is both a student and later a visitor. Writers of the time, Native American leaders. So it really was a landmark of New England. It becomes a space where Americans are asserting themselves as a kind of global power. What we think of as sort of provincial Boston in the colonial period was anything but. It was very much connected to things happening um, in all corners of the world. This was one of Harvard's first collections. It's an early example of a teaching cabinet or teaching collection where objects are being acquired specifically for the purposes of uh, teaching and research. In 1820, that collection was dispersed to various campus and Boston museums. And now, almost 200 years later, we're bringing the small portion of that collection that survives back together.